that uh, the in the case of Newtonian things. So this part of the potential here corresponds to the attractive gravity and then the centrifugal force. The two are always are acting together, and then here the centrifugal force begins to drop in it, and you get the thing going up to And so if you have got a particle with this kind of energy here, they do this then to drop. For the same angular momentum. If I reduce the energy to zero, to, to, to minimum energy, but then it will be a circular. So something which comes from infinity will go and make it and go. So that will be either hyperbolic or parabolic. Hyperbolic parabolic if it comes with zero energy. So then it became a general energy. So in addition to the uh, Newtonian gravitational attractive force and the centrifugal force, when you come very close to the center, Okay, then you have got the domination by the general electricity gravitation. That's why it turns out. So you're going to peak. So uh, if a particle sits on this peak, what do I mean by that? If it has exactly the energy of this particular, look at that R, they will sit at this peak. And so they will be unstable. If it sits here, a thing like this, it will be a stable circular orbit. But otherwise, the orbit here will, it will not be elliptical because of the one upon r term. Uh, the, the orbit will be as you see with precessive. Right? And then uh, this is where the minimum occurs, this minimum, and then maximum occurs. So if I go on increasing, decreasing L, uh, so then the minimum and the maximum converge. And then from particular value of 2 root 3 in geometrical units, so you see that the minimum and maximum same point. So after this, there will be no maximum. So what it would mean is that any particle coming in will just plunge into this. But if you've got angular momentum less sense, because you know in Newtonian gravity, uh, if you come straight along the radial orbit, uh, along a constant uh, constant angle, just come radially inverse, then the angular momentum will be zero because you're passing through the origin. And therefore uh, you always hit the single line. It, but in the Newtonian case, if there's even the smallest amount of angular momentum, then you will be Whereas here, uh, after this, there's no going back. And that's all. What is the implication of this one? I think I should put it here, right? Okay. So these are the different kinds of orbits which are already described. And then uh, in the case of uh, photons, there will be a maximum, there's no minimum. <coughs> so, <coughs> so you get uh, you can have unstable circular, and that, that will correspond to the photon sphere. And so then we consider the, the, the curved black hole. And here you've got the event horizon, which is not circular, it only this projection is circular, but you also got something called the ergosphere. And particles which are inside the ergosphere will always be dragged because of the rotation of the black hole. And so then uh, the black holes can have. Nothing other than mass, spin, and charge. And charge is typically astrophysically not possible, so mass and spin. So, just like we have the Schwarzschild metric, here you get what's known as a curl metric. And it's, it's far more complex, as you see. And we have no time to look at it. And uh, then it has got a ring singularity. And so, the singularity here is stretched out in the because of the much more complex uh, structure of the metric. Then uh, uh, this is the amount of uh, maximum energy that you can extract from. So what do you what do you mean by that? Because it's an extremely important question. Is that let us say that there's a particle going in a circular orbit, okay, uh, and uh, in a certain angular moment. Now I extract energy from it. So then what happens? So if I extract energy from it, what tell me what happens? 
So because uh, for that given angular momentum, I've got a minimum. But if I decrease angular momentum, the minimum will be closed. Okay, so the particle can go to that. But in the process, its energy has decreased. It has become more negative. And what has happened to the difference in energy? It cannot go out. Right? So we can put a disk, a creation disk. So there will be different rings in the disk. And they're all brushing with each other. And because of that brushing, they lose angular momentum and energy. And so the irritating shrink and the one outside will keep expanding to compensate for the shrink, to exact energy. But as it comes closer and closer, it will actually come to R minimum is equal to R max. And in order to have a stable orbit, we need the minimum. But we have seen that R minimum becomes equal to R max, so there is no minimum. So after that, the particle is just plug. So the maximum energy that you can extract is up to the point okay, where uh, R min becomes equal to R max. Right? So now the important thing is that uh, that point is much closer to the black hole than the black hole is spinning. So, so here you see uh, that uh, how about what's the, the innermost circular, stable circular orbit? That happens as 6 RG. RG is equal to a Schwarzschild radius of orbit. So it happens at three times the Schwarzschild radius. But whereas um, this is for Schwarzschild, for the extreme curved black hole, extreme curved meaning what? Uh, you know that there's a limit to the angular momentum, so the extreme, uh, extremely rotating black hole, maximally rotating black hole, to the arc in the most stable circular orbit is equal to arc. Right? So, uh, so you see that and when it is, uh, so this is A by N is equal to 1, it goes there, and then you see the amount of energy extracted is much more because this this energy is much more negative. They are difficult concepts, but uh, you need to go and look at them. But when you read them, you'll understand. And so uh, I talked about this one. So we did this uh, two times. Gravitational collapse, black hole. Then. Uh, did I do this one, the road slope? We will mention it, yeah. What uh, puts the limit on the spin parameter? What puts the limit? See, uh, because if you, it comes from the structure of the metric. Okay, so it's a structure of the metric. You can see from there it becomes a limit. And so we discussed Lagrangian points, and then the thing flows from across the Lagrangian point. And so if you've got an X ray bundle, for example, signals X1. Okay, then there's a massive star sitting here, and then it is filling the road slope where the matter goes and falls onto uh, the black hole. Because the matter has angular momentum, it forms a disk, and the kind of theory which I was just speaking about uh, becomes uh, it, it, in, it actually happy. Right? So, <clears throat> so you see that high mass because so high mass donor, you know what's a high mass donor? What do you mean by high mass donor? The mass, compared to what? mass flow is from the high mass companion. Uh, no, uh, um, when you say high mass entry binary, well, what's the definition? Is that the mass from the star has to be greater than the mass of the conductor. Okay, whereas in the low mass entry binary, the mass is lower than the mass of the conductor. So, why is that important? So, that is because, see, when matter flows from one object to another, if, if, the, if the mass moving object is more massive and this is less massive, then you can show very, very easily that the two will come together. Okay, so so then you have got you have got the matter filling the row stroke, and then as the matter passes, they come closer. So the row stroke radius decreases, so there's more matter outside the row stroke, and so it starts going very faster. There is a low mass X-ray binary, then matter flows from uh, when it flows from the low mass source. To the compact object, then the binary will actually expand. Okay, so the star keeps expanding gradually to fill the row slope, and the row slope radius expands because the binary expands. And so you can study outpouring of matter uh, from the star into the compact object, so that that binary can exist for a very, very long time. Then, uh, then we look at the LIGO, did I come to this? You, you must have seen this picture. Right? Then, so here, uh, what has happened is that you've got, you've got two 
black holes there, and which are spinning, and which are already quite close to each other. And then they, uh, they are losing energy rapidly by gravitational waves, and therefore they must be shrink. Is this clear to you? That as the energy decreases, they must be coming closer. Right? So, uh, and then uh, when, they, when it comes to this, you see there is a very short time scale. Okay, just going from about 0.2 seconds to the start to 0.2 seconds, 0.45 seconds, it's all done. So the huge to huge objects, they just spiral into it and then they, they collide together and they merge into a black hole. Okay, so and when that happens, so you see that this is a, and the most important thing here is that the period is decreased. Okay, which is which is proof of the fact that the things are spiraling in place. And then they merge into each other. And when they merge into each other, you, know, you get all these quantum. Where do all these quantities come from? And so they they come from uh, they come from the fitting. Okay, meaning that you have got a particular waveform which you have seen, and then you've got the entire parallel structure. And then you, you predict the thing from that and you fit it. And when you fit it, you get all these parameters. And it's an over determinant in the sense that the same, you can get a different, a lot of parameters, which you can't in the normal Newtonian case. You, you see, I, I told you that you can't determine the mass exactly for a binary system because of the inclination. When you have general relativity, you have got extra parameters. There. As a result of this, you can determine the angular inclination force that cannot be done within the scale. Okay, so you see that here you have got. The first black hole mass 36 and 29 solar masses, and then the final black hole mass is 62 solar masses. So this is 65, this is 62. So where did the rest of the mass go? Gravitational. Gravitational. Right? And then the interesting thing is that you can also determine that independently. That meaning that I get I get a fit for the amount of energy which has been uh, <coughs> expelled uh, through gravitational waves. Okay, and that turns out to be the total energy emitted in gravitational waves is 3 mc squared. And that exactly is equal to this minus. Okay, but this is an independently fitted quantity. And, and then the peak gravitational luminosity, 3.6 in the to the 56 Hz per second. And do you know what is, if I ask you what is the characteristic luminosity of a quasar, how much is it? You know what's a quasar, right? <laughs> So it's about 10 to the 47, if you've got a prime quasar, it's 10 to the 47. So here this is so many times more than the quasar. Of course, it, it gets over it, uh, as we have seen, in a very small fraction. Okay, so it's emitting 200 solar masses per second. Okay, yeah. Now, an extremely important thing here is that the black hole binary and its merger would not have been detected by in any other way. Okay, because see, if you have got if you have got a neutron star and a neutron star in orbit around each other, you know that they will merge and then you will see all the electromagnetic signals. So even if you don't detect the gravitational wave, if you happen to be looking at that part of the sky, you will have detected everything else. Okay, so you have got what is called multivalent astronomy, but multivalent observation. But you have got multi-messenger observation. You do that when you detect gravitational waves. But when there are two black holes which are uh, merging into each other. Then you get, uh, you couldn't observe it by any other means. Okay, <clears throat> then how do we know that it's a black hole? So I've always told you that when you look at these X ray binaries, for example, uh, there is always, uh, you know that it's a compact object, and you know that it has got a mass which is so much. But you can't say that, always say that it's a black hole. There's a whole series of algorithms which you but here it is completely dark. I already mentioned you that there is signal frequency, the rise in signal frequency, because the frequency was increasing. So, okay, that indicates that the signal is generated by binary in spite. Okay, because if it were a stable binary, then you would get the same frequency. And uh, uh, the detailed uh, evolution of frequency and amplitude indicate that it's a massive object, because it comes out of the field, out of the, out of the model. Okay, I think the highest frequency indicates that the, it's very compact and approach each other to within 200 kilometers. So there are these two very massive objects and they're coming within 200 kilometers of each other. So it cannot be an object like a star. Okay, because the star would have 
far greater radiance and they wouldn't have come being able to come. They would destroy each other before coming so close. Right? And then they could be in principle, no, only come because uh, they can't do white dwarfs. Because white dwarfs are only 6,000 kilometers. But they have to 200 kilometers. Okay, so then they can't be neutron stars. Right? So why can't they be neutron stars? Yeah. Pardon me? They have some upper mass. Yeah, perfect. Because it's about three solar masses. And here you're talking about 30 solar masses. Right? right? So, uh, so it can't be neutron stars, and therefore, the only objects it can be is black holes. And then, not only in this kind of a logical argument, but even the, the spin forms. Okay, and then there's a better form. You know, it is ringing, like a ringing of a bell. It's called a ring dark. All that is completely consistent with the with the predictions made long ago by the Okay, so it's a very nice diagram. Uh, beautiful one. This symmetry in the diagram that doesn't mean it. Okay, it's just an attractive way of saying it. So what it does is that it is what are the masses? Uh, what are the black hole masses? It's called a stellar graveyard, right? The evolution of stars. These are these are all considered the stellar masses. Black holes which have come out of stellar processes. And so here, uh, so, so, so you see that here, these are electromagnetic neutron stars, EM neutron stars. What do you mean by that? Means that they have been discovered through um, electromagnetic means. You see that every, you know that we know thousands of pulsars. Each one of those pulsars is a neutron star. Okay, but these are, these here you, you know the masses. Okay, and so you see that the masses are down. And then the gravitational wave the drop starts are here. <coughs> but, okay, then you have got electromagnetic black holes. And then anyway, what are the electromagnetic black holes? The one in X-ray binary system. Because again, they have been discovered through X-ray, X-ray electromagnetic waves. Right? And then these are the ones which are being discovered by LIGO. Okay, so, so for example, and then they will show you that uh, there are the, they attach them together, it means that this and this have merged to form this. So just take a look at the diagram after which you find it very easily. And so this is the current state of knowledge. The current, current state of the knowledge meaning when uh, it, the LIGO had three observing groups. Okay, O1, O2, O3. And O3 got over sometime uh, before COVID. And in fact, they stopped it early because COVID started. Okay, then uh, O4 had just now started. So about, I think it started just about a month ago. O4. And so, uh, maximum mass, sorry, yeah? It takes black holes only during a merger of two gravitation waves. Uh, yes, because uh, see, the point is that uh, we, we later on, when we are more advanced instrumented, more sensitive instrumented, we should be able to take that. See, when they, are, when they are much further apart, much weaker. Okay, and then the frequency is much larger. And LIGO, you see, when they are merging together at these kind of black holes, so the frequency that they get is exactly at the uh, very high sensitivity of LIGO. So that is how you can detect that. As, as LIGO becomes more and more sensitive in the future, and then you'll be able to detect them in the then there are also other ways of detecting uh, these things. Because there could be a lot of sources so which are detected, which are emitting weak gravitation. So you know that there's a cosmic microwave background, right? And where did it come from? It came from the hot part. So it's filling it. So like that, uh, you can see a background light of the sky. So uh, so for example, when you do astronomical observations, uh, you see that you could drive away from Pune, you don't see anything. Okay, because the sky is so bright. Okay, then you go to uh, a smaller place, the sky is dark. And when you go to a very good site, like in Ladakh, or in Hawaii, or in Chile, the sky is very dark. Right? But, uh, but what happens, and then uh, the sky is dark, but there is a certain minimum background which simply can't be caught here. And that background is because of um, the light emitted by all the galaxies. And so they are, they are, you don't detect the galaxy but you can detect the background. Right? It is some uh, 22 magnitudes per arc second square. 
in the big bag. Because so there is a limit. And it's it's added, added right of all the galaxies. So uh, but now here, similarly, there are lots of weak gravitational wave sources. This is filling the whole universe. Because all the galaxies and so forth, and they're all the emitting gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves are the passing spots. Okay, you can you can detect those. Not presently, but with different kinds of uh, gravitational wave detectors in the universe. Okay. Uh, so, so this is another thing, the 150 solar mass binary pressure, uh, which is detected by LIGO. Okay, so, uh, so now why am I talking about it? That is because this mass, I told you that there is the stellar mass black holes, uh, which uh, one, one really expected that will be like 20, 25 solar mass. Okay, but LIGO has already thrown up uh, with, uh, much more massive than that. Okay, but the maximum mass that has been seen here is like 150 solar masses. And then you go into the territory, which is known as intermediate mass black holes. So we are after, uh, after about uh, 100 solar masses and up to about 10 to 5 solar masses, you would call them intermediate mass black holes. So they will talk about, but this is the first direct that. So let's see the black holes. Okay, so they are detected a black hole of 20 to 10 to the 5 solar masses. So how do you detect these black holes? I'll, I'll just mention that in the Okay, so uh, now this is all the kind of thing where it's a supermassive black hole in a giant elliptical galaxy. So, uh, okay, so, so here you have got this uh, very large elliptical galaxy. So uh, then I'll, I'll be talking about different kinds of galaxies that go along. Particular large galaxy, and we have detected it because of the X ray emission. And you can conclude that that corresponds to a black hole uh, with a mass of 4 into 10 to the 10 solar masses. This is really, really massive. But on the other hand, the galaxy is also very massive. The mass of our own galaxy will be more than 10 to the 11 solar masses. Okay? A few times to several times. So this is 10 to the 13, 10 galaxies. And uh, there are, we, we always need these length scales. So we are considering this length scale, which is a Schwarzschild difference. And, uh, and you know, I already normalized it for you. The 3 to 10 to the 8 into m upon This one also should be 10 to the 8, so it will be wrong. And so we have seen this number. And so then there's something called the radius of the Okay, and that is Rh, which is equal to Gm by sigma squared. And what is sigma square? Sigma square is the uh, is the dispersion velocity of the stars. You see the stars in a galaxy. So if you want a if you got a disk in a galaxy, how will the stars be going? They'll be going to circular orbits around the center. Right? But if you've got an elliptical galaxy, you go to the center, circular orbit, how will the orbits be? So there'll be some stars going in this orbit, some stars going in that orbit. So the orbit is not an They are they are isotropic. <coughs> Or non isotropic depending upon the physical. So then, when you look at it, you can see that there is a dispersion velocity of stars. Because stars are going on the orbit and also there will be gradual velocity. Okay, so, uh, so you have, why do you think, why, why do you think this, really, this was an important case? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you know why this is important. But why is this an important thing? So, um, pardon me? No, even horizon is this one. There's nothing to do with even horizon. Okay, sigma is dispersion velocity. I mean, you can say that the mean velocity of the star speed. And so then, you know, the, the way to guess it, if I just take this one here and bring RH down, okay, then you see that it is G M by R. That tells you what. So if I just if I for a particular star, star so so you see that you have got here uh, R H is equal to and G M by uh, sigma square. I can write it as sigma square is equal to G M by R H. And what is this? Right. So if I take this is 
if I get multiplied the marks in the star. So you see that this is kinetic energy and this is the potential energy. And so, uh, so which means that at that RH, okay, the, the gravitational energy becomes comparable to the kinetic energy. And so which means that the gravity gets subdued the stars. And because if the gravity is much greater than the kinetic energy, much greater than the stars will not be influenced so much. Right, but here, the, when I decrease RH, it becomes even more powerful. And so, so what happens is that, uh, and then this is theta H, theta H is equal to the RH upon the distance of the it's, it's an angular size. And because the influence of gravity becomes larger here. Similarly, you can have something called a tidal radius. Because of, uh, you see that if a star is coming close to a compact object, then they, you see, um, so I got a compact object here. There's a star coming close to it. So, so I got, so this has got a uh, force acting on this one, but it also got a force acting on this one. Right? So if I, if I sit at the center, and right, so that will be one force is actually one force. And um, what will be the difference in the two forces? Because so this will be G. M. So uh, if I take this distance to be R, so this will be G M upon R plus delta R, and this will be G M upon R minus delta R. So this force will be greater than this force. So the net effect will be the circle will become ellipsoidal. Okay, because it's called a tidal force. So exactly the reason why there are tides. And then as the star moves closer and closer, the tidal force becomes greater and greater. And then the star gets pulled out and smashed. And so now, that if the tidal radius is greater than the short shell radius, then the star will get pulled out and then matter falls on it and it emits radiation, which you can see. And if not, uh, if, this, if the tidal radius is smaller than the short shell radius, it would mean that the whole star will disappear into the black hole. So these are all extremely interesting concepts. All right. <laughs> now there are, uh, because we want to talk about supermassive black holes in galaxies. And uh, what are the different kinds of galaxies? I'm sure you are seeing this Hubble diagram before, right? So you've got elliptical galaxies, you've got spiral galaxies, and you've got lenticular galaxies here. And then these are the bar galaxies. So these are the unbarred galaxies, these are the bar. So, uh, so now uh, elliptical galaxies are in a certain number of small number of cases uh, associated with very powerful radio sources. The GMRT is finding such sources all the time. Right? So, so this is a very famous source, Sectarus A. Okay, so you've got a beautiful, you've got a double lobe structure, you've got a jet going out. So you are, you are studying this. And so this is, um, so again, the sector of say, with the elliptical galaxy, so the galaxy has got a very giant uh, dust disk. Okay, and then this is perpendicular to dust disk. Okay, and the closest radio galaxy to the Earth is sensitive three to five megapartals. <clears throat> okay, so, so then here you see, so you have got, uh, it's a very beautiful galaxy, Sigma A. This is a radio picture. And you can see the bright nucleus. And you can see a jet going out. And you see that this distance is very large. Because they're very large objects. And so the jet is remaining steady for a very, very great distance. Okay, so, so it must be what holds it. It has got to be an accretion disk here. There's a disk there which is rotating very happy. Okay, and then this, the thing is, very steady. Then it, it of course precises for a long period. Okay, so then you get this. And then other, uh, so this is called an active galaxy also. So what do you mean by an active galaxy? It's a galaxy in which, uh, I'll come back to this one. Look here, yeah, I'm in a lecture. Okay, uh, I'm giving a lecture, I'll call you. So there's something urgent going on. <laughs> and so then, uh, 
So this is an object that's an actual galaxy. So yeah, I was saying that what is the of an actual galaxy is that it is, uh, the, uh, if you look at all the energy coming from the stars, how much will that be then? If asked him a quick estimate, is what is the amount of energy coming out from the stars from the galaxy? Yes, so how do you get it? Yeah, so, no, so, so just take it. I mean, when you want to estimate it, you say every star is like the sun, because sun is a completely normal star. Right. So how much is the energy coming from the sun? You need to remember it. It is 4 to 10 to the sun. Okay? Right? And then, then you see uh, how many stars are there? 10 to the left. So 10 to the 44. So if, you, if in a galaxy, the amount of non-thermal energy is coming from the center, is comparable to the amount of energy which comes from stars and equal to active. Right? So in our galaxy also you get X-rays, you get everything from the center. Okay, but it's just that uh, it is like a small fraction of the energy emitted by the stars. Right? So but here is the quasar. And I, I think I'll be showing you picture this quasar as a sector, which looks exactly like a star. So it's a point also. Okay, but the amount of energy coming from it um, is very um, is comparable uh, to the energy of the whole galaxy. It can be taken to the 47, 49. And right? so therefore, uh, there, when is the galaxy? Uh, there are a lot of controversy about that, but now people are pretty well able to uh, see galaxies around it, but it's very high dynamic. And so this is the quasar. So, uh, and then the characteristic of the quasar which you are seeing is that it has got this continuum, which is non-stellar. So what do you mean by non-stellar? Galaxies have got a stellar continuum, meaning that galaxies have different populations of stars. All the populations have, you know that they have got like a black body with all the absorption lines and so on. And then you add it up to them. So you get a particular kind of continuum. So it's all produced by the stars. Okay, but this, the quasar continuum, is quite different from continuum produced by the stars. And this comes from the nucleus, central nucleus. Okay, so, and then, then there are the emission lines. What the emission lines indicate is that the very energetic radiation, which is exciting uh, atoms, and then so these are emitting these lines. Okay, so there, and then other great characteristic of quasars is that they are very, they are very on all kinds of time scales. So if you look at it in optical, they can vary uh, uh, in a year, two years, five years, ten years, a period of time. But if you do it in x rays, for example, you can get uh, in the hundreds of seconds. Or so. so, and what the variability indicate, um, I think I already mentioned that too much, is that um, if there's a variability which happens at a time scale of tau, okay, then the radius of the radiating object must be less than or equal to theta. Do you know this? I'm sure there'll be mentioned. Okay. So what I'm saying is that if an object uh, if varies on a time scale tau, then the radius of that object must be smaller than a uh, equal So do you, do you see why this should be true? From maximum speed of light. Pardon? From causality. Yes. Okay, so uh, rather than say, yeah, rather than say causality, you say it like this. So, so you have got, let's say that you have got an object with a large radius r. Okay? Now, uh, now think of that uh, if it is now, suppose we vary a bit on a time scale and r is much greater than theta. Okay? And so, uh, I know that the object of the thing is very large, r greater than theta. So, so what happens is that you can imagine uh, regions with a radius of theta. Right? So now each one of them is uh, varying with us. What happens is that they'll be varying at random. They'll be varying in the uncorrelated fashion. Why? Because there's no communication. Like you said, there's no causality. <coughs> because of causality, there's no communication. So when one is getting brighter, the other will be getting dimmer. As a result of this, the amplitude of variation will get damped. So if you say, if you see an object varying rapidly uh, and varying quite a lot, okay, then it must be that R must be comparable to C tau or much more. And so, so then what, uh, what are the numbers then? 
So supposing I get variable at 100 seconds, then seek out between 10 to the 12 seconds. So I told you that in the X-rays, you can easily get variable to the 200 seconds. So it means that the radius must be 10 to the 12 seconds. And how many light years is that? So a light year, if I ask you what's, what's the light year in centimeters, is it 3 to 10 to the 10? To 3 to 10 to the 7. And why 3 to 10 to the 7? Per year. The number of seconds per year. Okay, so there is 9 into 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 8. So how much is this? So this is 10 to the, uh, so it's 10 to the 12 centimeters. So it's 10 to the minus 6 light years. Okay, so it is a very, very tiny thing. A lot of energy is coming from. So then, uh, so then as people started discovering quasars, and then all these things coming up, the rapid variability is there, and strong emission lines are there, and the spectrum is quite different from the spectrum of stars. And then uh, other observations which were found, and for this you need VLBR, very long based time development, about which I'm sure you are Okay, we do VLBR. This is not a VLBR picture, this is actually a modern picture, more than 20 years ago. But, uh, so it is a uh, uh, it's with the Hubble Space Telescope, which also has very high resolution. So you see that this object looked like this in 1994 and looked like this in 1998. So if you can mark the points here, then you, you see how far, you know the distance of the object, and therefore you start to the receiving at six times the speed of light. Okay, so it was first discovered, and people thought it's an illusion. It actually is an illusion, but they thought there's some, there's some problem and so on and so forth. Until Martin Rees gave the explanation. Okay, why do you see the uh, superluminal thing? So the idea is the following. Let us suppose that there's an object which is sitting here and it has thrown out another object at an angle sign, okay, which is also radiating. So you see that uh, when you get the first pulse, you see a got here. And the second pulse comes when the object is here. And so you can that you can you can you can say that, that the velocity that you will find from this is a very simple calculation and I have practically done it here. You see beta sine psi upon one minus beta cos psi. The psi is an angle. So if psi is equal to pi by two for example, then beta a is simply equal to the velocity with which it is actually found. Because this will be one, this will be zero, and beta a is equal to beta. Right? But if psi is small, then psi and psi can be shown to be equal to 1 upon gamma. The gamma is a Lorentz factor. And then, so beta, the maximum beta that you get out of this, you can, you can, you can just find what the maximum you can get and then you equal to gamma beta. And so, uh, and uh, so, so, the, so this can be very large. Because gamma can be easily 5 or 10, the Lorentz factor. And so you can get 5, 10 times So what is actually happening is that because the object it first emits and then it moves closer to you. And as it moves closer to you, it takes the next signal takes less time to come. And then therefore you believe that it has moved much. So you get a superliminal speed. An extremely simple explanation. There are also other things. There are also flat sample explanation. Meaning that we see uh, supposing that there is one. Uh, the blobs are uh, symmetrically, one blob is moving towards you and the other blob is away from you. And because of special relativistic effects, uh, you can show that uh, uh, the flux of the blob is coming towards you, divided by the flux of the blob which is moving away from you, is equal to this quantity. And uh, you can see what is this ratio. As psi becomes smaller, this ratio can become thicker. And so, so the, the, the problem is like this, because you, when you've got these uh, radio sources, you see a jet coming down. Okay? And the jet will be quite often one side. You don't see the color. So because why? So there are all kinds of theories. Then what it will be pointed down to sometimes pointed away from you sometimes and so forth. Then it becomes clear that this is a very elegant and correct explanation. There are two, two jets coming, one towards you and away from you. The flux of this is much more enhanced in the flux. Right? So, <clears throat> so you get this. And then you all observe. And look at this M87. I'm sure you have seen this uh, very famous 
is the giant electrical galaxy with the Virgo cluster. And then, so you see that C2 works in the simple side of Okay, that's because of the application. And then, uh, this has been magnified, <coughs> this, to zoom in on it. And you see that in order to uh, zoom in, you need, uh, you need to go for the lower wavelengths. Why lower wavelengths? Resolution. Resolution, exactly. And so, smaller wavelengths, and here you go to millimeter wavelengths, and you clear the jet, and then 18 centimeters, no, uh, and this is 18 centimeters, but it is now real here. And look at much higher resolution. So you see that the jet is just holding on, but very, very large scale, a very tiny scale to very large scale, just holding on. So now, uh, so, so you see that, what is all this telling you? Uh, this is telling you that there are very large velocities approaching the velocity of light, and that is why you are seeing these things. And at large velocity, you see that if you have a very really large velocity, it must always be accompanied by a large gravitational field. Is that clear to you? Why? Because that is what powers them. So you see that if the gravitational field was not large, it could have just carried and gone. So the large gravitational field is holding it all. And the stronger the gravitational field, the greater the velocity. So what it means is that uh, and you have got large energy there. And how much is the energy? You can estimate the energy in the radio lobes. And this are the, all these arguments are given by Professor Jeffrey Burbage. Okay, have you heard of him? Jeffrey Burbage. He, he, was, he was one of the great men of astrophysics in the 1950s and 60s. So he had his wife, Margaret Burbage, and they come here very often. And you are extremely um, heavyweight with him. And you couldn't believe that a person can be so weighty. And then they are all contributing very greatly to us. And so the energy in the low is 10 to the 60th density people earth in that range. And then so if GM, if it must be coming from, if that were comparable to the gravitational energy, because that's what will power it. So where did the energy in the lobes come from? It came from the jets. So which must, so there is the gravity which is powering it. Okay, then, then you see that uh, if GM square by R equal to G low, then at R is equal to R. So why is R equal to R? Because they see it's extremely rapid variable. They know it's a tiny source. Okay, then the mass must be about 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10 solar mass. So what is the conclusion here? The conclusion is that um, that if you want all this power, if you want the very high velocities, then one sensible source for doing reasonable source for doing is a supermassive black hole sitting. So there's also another very elegant argument given by a little bit. I mean, you're also one of the all-time greats. And uh, he, uh, so little bit, he said that, look, I'm mean, supposing the thing is coming from um, nuclear fusion. Because nuclear fusion is so of energy. Let us say all this much of energy coming from nuclear fusion. But you know that nuclear fusion is not very efficient. Okay, this was just about... Uh, when you, when you do the whole thing at 0.007, which is usually. So, which means that if you want to extract so much energy, so you have to, you, you need a, there'll be ash which is formed. Like when you form hydrogen, the ash is what? Helium. Helium. When you very few, sir. The ash is helium. Right? And then the mass of the ash becomes extremely large. And then the gravitational energy becomes so large that the nuclear energy does not be there. Right, so these are all because people are not giving a very logical argument in which people all understand. But it took a couple of decades for people to understand this. Because you know what discoveries you make, look at it, what is all that's going on? Okay, what, uh, why is this thing which is a stellar object and why is it behaving so crazy? Why does it have such high energy? So all those things were done by uh, people over a period of time. And so what are these scales now? So again, uh, so you've got a thing there, and uh, you've got, yeah, I'm sure that Sri Anand is a black hole with a broad line with a narrow line. Because from the active galactic nuclei, you get the initial lines, which can be broad, which can be narrow. And then the broad line region is much smaller, about one parsec max, and then at a kiloparsec, this is like a 
So when switch came, you get the Magellan region, and then you've got the jet region going on from here, and this is a thicker cushion disk with Kalimba. If there's no action, the dust disk will give you a cushion disk. And so this is the sort of a standard picture where you've got a cushion disk, and then there's a there's a spinning black hole, and the ultimate energy uh, it will be is extracted from the spin of the black hole. Okay, so the black hole will become slower and slower. And then the energy which is emitted is being converted to jets from various complex processes which are not necessarily fully understood in the present time, and then you, you get that. These are quasar host carriers, the picture observation which I took very long ago, uh, was that uh, these are all galaxies at that time which were believed in. So, uh, Dalikar and R and and others, they believed that these quasars are not really the centers of galaxies. Okay, so, so then a lot of observations were made. And even you can see these are all galaxies, host galaxies of these And uh, they are also observed very faint quasar, which was a very faint galaxy around them. And so, uh, so now uh, what I've done is that I've given you these arguments. To establish that there is a every supermassive black hole, the center of gravity, and how do you look for that? How do you search that? Uh, there are, first of all, there are many active galaxies, but are they there in the other galaxies? Meaning that you uh, is, a, is a supermassive black hole a necessary part of the galaxy formation process? Okay, when was it formed? Do you first start from the galaxy and then the black hole, or the black hole and the galaxy builds around it, or you start with a slow mass black hole and then it gradually accretes matter from the surrounding galaxy in the stars and becomes. So, so you see that, uh, let us suppose that we have talked of 10 to the 9 solar masses, which is 1 billion solar masses. Okay, so let us suppose that that kind of a mass is built up over a billion years. So, how much matter would it be to accrete per year? And if you 10 to the 9, you have to go 10 to the 9. <laughs> so, it's a one solar mass. So, if, if a black hole, you start with a low mass black hole and just keep swallowing one star per year, you don't see very much. Okay, then you can build 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole. And, but it's not that straightforward, but I'm saying that it is possible. So, then you say that, look, uh, there can be a supermassive black hole in all galaxies, but you they become active um, only when they, they get sufficient matter. And then they can be active for some of the time, and then they can go off. Okay, then they can again become active. And so, so then uh, you, you want to look for, you want to search for black holes. So then, you know that these famous ones are told at maybe seven. <clears throat> and then our own galactic center, um, have you, has anybody told you about the black hole in the center of a galaxy? Has that been done? You probably have forgotten what has been done and what has not been done because there's so much that's done. Anyway, so, so my name is actually new, so it's all right. And then, so, uh, so what happens is it called, look at the motion of the stars around the center, and then you see whether there is a black hole. Okay, then you can gas them. Very can we see that the gas keeps going on the black hole. So you can look for uh, you can look for disks which are there, like the emission which come from the disk. Then relativistic effects. Okay, meaning uh, it will affect the shape of emission lines. And then, then first of all, you have to find these, and then you have to say that the effects which are found, uh, the, that the alternatives to black holes are in process. Because the way I say, if it is a 50 solar mass object, compact object, uh, then then we know that it is not. Uh, it is it, it, that uh, it can't be a neutron star. Okay, so uh, let me quickly run through this. So this is uh, you know work which are done by Gensel and Kiets for which they got half a Nobel Prize a few years ago, and then uh, 2020, and the other half went towards the penguins. And so, so this is our galaxy, and then uh, this is our galaxy at near infrared wavelengths. It's a panoramic picture, right? Meaning that. To point, you can see the disk of the galaxy, right? You can see Akash Ganga. And then you point the camera there, and then you, you can take the picture. So this is a galactic center. And the galactic center can be clearly seen in the Sagittarius constellation. 
And so, and then, now if you, now what you want to do is to measure, say that, look, it's a, it's a supermassive black hole here in the center. I want to, I want to look at the motion of stars. So you want to see individual stars. So then you want a big problem in shape stars. Because if you take, if you, start, you see that we are about eight kiloparsecs per second. And so, now if you take a star like the sun and take it far away, eight kiloparsecs, then it becomes very big. So that's one problem. The other problem is, in the, in the, and it becomes further dim because of the dust. You see the brown thing there? So then it does. And that can lead to 20 magnitudes of effect. So a two magnet object can become 22 magnet objects. And so, so therefore, how do you get over it? First of all, use big telescopes. Whenever you want to see faint object, you use big telescopes. Secondly, use near infrared cameras. Okay, so because, because you know that as the wavelength increases, the absorption due to the dust decreases. So use near infrared cameras. Right, and then, uh, <coughs> So these are the center of the galaxy, and at the center of the galaxy, there's an object called Sagittarius A. You must have, have you heard about Sagittarius A? Right? So it's a it's an object which is sitting there, not moving, etc. So that is identified to be the center of our galaxy. Right? And then, then you have got uh, you have got Sagittarius A star. And why A star? Because uh, it is a it's an exciting source. You know, a star in, in atomic physics, a star means an excited atom. So the people who discovered a star, it is a is a exception, not picture of it. And what is important for us is that you observe it at you know what an HK is, right? So just like you've got BDR in the optical, in the near infrared, you have the HK back. K is 2.2 microns, 22,000 microns. Okay, so so it's a, it's a composite and speckle and adaptive optics are used to increase the resolution. It's a very crowded thing. You see that, you know what the extent of a galaxy? 30 kilobytes, 100,000 light years. Okay, so this is just this one here. You see this bar? It is six light months. It's a very small portion of the galaxy. You see the visual stars there. And then you zoom in on there. So this is Sagittarius star. Okay, and so you see that the individual stars are there, and you track them. Okay, projected and radial motions of 100 stars with the central point one percent. Right, so you track them, and then uh, you see this particular star called Sagittarius A. No, S1. Is it S1 or S2? S2, particular star called S2. So that has been followed from 1992, okay, right down to 2002, 10 years, two independent groups. And then you see, you, know, you can beautifully fit this ellipse. Okay, this doesn't require GR or anything like that. If I give this thing, you can just fit an ellipse. And then using Newton's Kepler's law, they see that it's ellipse. Newton's law lets you estimate the mass. And the mass turns out to be. Uh, 3.7 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. And it's sitting at one focus, exactly like a place goes. Okay, and then, uh, and then you see, uh, what was, as an extremely compact object. See, typically when you say MPC, you mean megaparsec. So here it is, milliparsec. So it's a very, very compact object, I think. So what does this mean? Is that you've got this beautiful ellipse. Okay, and then, uh, this star is coming so close to the ellipse there. And you see that if it were a star, if it were a star or anything like that, then it would be, it would perturb the orbit. If it is the extended orbit, perturb the orbit, when it comes so close. The orbit is not perturb, which means that it is likely to be an extremely compact object. Okay, so if it's likely to be a uh, supermassive black hole. And then, then you see here, uh, this is further in 2009. So that was, you remember, we started from 1992 and we came to 2000, 2002. And here in the 2009, it's gone up there. And what's the orbital period? 15 years. It goes round the orbit once in And then you see, you see here, if the orbit is not complete, no, no, it's, not, it's not exactly over there. Right? And so why is that? 
So you say that if you look at the object at the center, so it will be moving slightly. And the object moves slightly, it will put a rock. So then you'll get that was thought to be the correct explanation. And uh, then here, so at this level, the mass is 4.31, and then we get this exact distance of the object. Right, and so you see that here, so I get a beautiful thing, and it has been done uh, by two different groups, red dots and blue. And so both the leaders of both the groups were the Nobel Prize. And this is really reassuring because it's incredibly complex getting these uh, positions over so the period of time. Okay, and then you're going this way. But then other absolutely beautiful thing happens. So these are the three predictions of Einstein's theory, the additional red field, making of light and precision. And, uh, and how is it the precision for such as he was not a precision for Mercury, there's 43 arc seconds per century. Now, what they did was that um, as time passed, the instruments became better and better. And then you see that there are four weird things when you go to the very large telescope in South America, there are four of those identical things. So they learned how to combine the light from the four in a given instrument. It's called, it's called a gravity experiment. So reality four telescope B that gave a combined uh, uh, this one accuracy of 65 micro arc seconds. And so, so that is the accuracy with which you could determine the position. So when you did that, and so this was in uh, when is it? This was just about a year ago. The same thing. You can see here in this observation. That this is not moving any longer. Okay, it is. So you said we said it moved and that perturbed off. It did. But what happens is that the accuracy is enough now for you uh, to say that the orbit is precessing. So it is not closing because it is precessing. And I told you several times why did the precession occur? Because of general relativity, because of the one upon other. And so you can see how beautiful the whole experiment is starting in 1992. And first you create the supermassive black hole mass, and now you're saying it's precessing. And so, so here in the orbit of S2, because this is not a real thing, just an artist's impression. So it is, it is going through, you see, we're going to a minimum at 2018. Right? And you see that each orbit takes how long? 50.2 years. Right? So if you wait on so a sufficiently long time for 300 years, then it will come back to the You can see this. Beautiful precision. So, so you see that uh, extremely accurate thing in black hole, uh, but we are well beyond time of stop. And we could go on for other lecture, but we have to stop. Thank you. How yeah. about the supermassive black hole in a galaxy? Mm. And can we just compare the like of the, 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 like, the like how much time we have, we have taken to form such a thing? No, you see, you you see, you are you do not have way of directly getting the age of the supermassive black hole. Okay, but there are various theories that we give. Okay, which tell you in what way did it form, and then uh, how did it increase its mass? There could be a swarm of stellar black holes which all collect to collect the black holes. Like that, but I don't think that's actually the age of the supermassive black uh, there is no, um, I don't think that there is a correlation like that. So that is because there is a difficulty defining what we mean by the energy of the thing, but there are some other correlations. No, I'll show you. Look at this. So you've got you've got a mass of the bulge and the mass of the black hole, and you say correlation. So the dispersion velocity at the center and the mass of the black hole. And so, so a lot of different kinds of correlations. You know, it's already very tired by now. Not only really tired for today, but you have been here for four weeks. Five weeks. And so I had four lectures a day. How many lectures a day? Four lectures. Uh -huh. 
four lectures a day. So, so 20, 20 a week, so 80 lectures. So that's enough to get you completely sick and tired of the story. Oh, there was a good question. Can, can you read it out? How to define the lifetime in the moment of a black hole to change it to a single point of this? Yeah. <clears throat> so, let's say your mind. So, so the question is, uh, how do you define, because of the point object, how do you get the spin for the black hole? And so, so the answer, I mean, I, I, I discussed this very briefly um, in the lecture, is that um, the electron, for example, is a particle that is called zero points. Okay, and nevertheless, it is a So you cannot imagine it like a classical spin, because zero mass, it, it was zero mass, so it's zero radius of it. And how do you think? And so, so it is just that there's something which is akin to spin is associated. So here you can say that there is a there's the equation of the general and they are solved for a system with a certain symmetry. And then it turns out that there are two parameters there. One is the mass, and the other is the, the parameter S. And it turns out that spin that can be associated with an angular wave. It behaves like a wave. So um, for example, you say mass, but it's very difficult to actually formally define mass in the middle. People have spent decades trying to define it. But what do you mean by mass? Is that, uh, let's say I got a black hole, but I see I go very far and see a star which is in orbit around it. And then I can I can actually interpret it in Newtonian terms. When I say the mass of this black hole is 4 into 10 to the 6 solar masses, it comes out of a simple fitting. And so, but that doesn't mean that the mass has got exactly the same significance as mass in the So these are analogous concepts. All right. So thank you. How many more days do you have to go? So good. So I really enjoyed uh, talking to you and your questions, etc. Hope sometime I can cross you again. Maybe some of you will join Anika, some of you will join other institutions. So, all the best. Thank you so much. So, if you have got any specific thing to ask, you can send me an email.